So we're here today to discuss your reissue of your first EP, which is titled Babble, which uh, didn't come out so long ago. And why did you think now was the right time to kind of revisit this? Man, well, Babel, I, I the thing about Babel is I self-released that. And I went, you know, originally I was I had I was gonna release it through a European label and that 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 fell apart. So I was like me and um my writing partner at the time, we were like, well, let's just put it out ourselves. Um, so I I did, I took it on. I was like, well, basically a label is your bank. So I like mm took every penny I could find every penny I had and like invested it into releasing Babel press. I pressed it, put it out myself. And it was a lot harder than yeah. I could have ever imagined. And it kind of just like, didn't go anywhere. It just didn't have the, the train behind it to really give it the push. I just didn't know enough. And so it kind of just like my, my fans that have really stuck with me, they got a hold of it and they've like known about it, but it never really got the chance to really have a proper release. Right. So when I started working with uh, Karma Chief and after, you know, one of the conversations from the beginning was like, I would lo love to get Babel an official release. And Karma Chief is that train, does that, does have that, that train to really push it. The machine. So, yeah, they're they're so good. I love working with them. And so um after Nine Lives, it was just like, all right, like I've been working on another record in the meantime. And it was just kind of like a no-brainer, like, let's let's do it. Let's give Babel its its official like chance to make some new friends. Right. Let's give it its shot. And of course, this time around you've added a few new tunes. You've got uh three new songs. And uh where did they come from? Did they were they around during the original release or are they newer tracks? There there there's three of them and they are probably more on the newer side. They're in that time after Babel before Nine Lives. Um I wrote them all at different times and I I after Babel I was so like I was like depressed after that, like musically depressed that I was like, I'm never putting out another record again. I'm mm. going to just do singles. This is the age of singles forever and ever and ever. So um, those I had kind of like just put out digitally and they even more than Babel did not go like nobody even knows. And so, mm. but they were all my favorite. Like I love each of those songs and especially like, Ride On is a really, really intimate, special song to me because I wrote it uh, after my brother passed away. Right. Kind of moved through that. And so that that is pressed to vinyl and like coming out, people are going to hear that. I feel like in the way that I wrote that for my brother to live on for me, right? that song gets to live on even more. And like other people can now use that song to get through what they got to get through. Because I mean, grief is a major part of life. It's something we all have to deal with. We can't. So to be able to like for that song, that, that song is a tool for me of just feeling the feelings. And I understand the importance of music in that it like it helps us to move through things and to accept feelings and accept like every like I, I every feeling is so important to the life experience right well i'm glad you bring that song up because i i uh i was attracted to that song i i read you know the story behind it a little bit and it got me thinking you know i'm a songwriter too and i i know sometimes songs are you know time capsules for the writer sometimes in ways more than more than even a photograph you know and when you're when you're a songwriter and there aren't that you know how many songwriters are there in the world right you write a song and you can look back on it uh and and really remember where you were at that time and what was going on and and have a very clear picture of yourself um and of course this song was dedicated to your late brother does that you know do, do, and you said it's a it's sort of a tool you know and you want other people to experience this but did you think about those things do you think about that uh now with that song uh, having such a uh um a close memory with it yeah i mean i i really like when my brother passed away in 2012 like the end of 2012 right before right very very unexpectedly and i 
put my whole life on pause to go home to Florida and just was like family first. I need to go be with my mom and dad. I need to go be with my little brother. And I dropped everything and like, just kind of like had a friend sublet my apartment and went to Florida for the month. And like those first few days there was all the like, oh man, I had never had anybody like close to me pass away before I had my grandma, you know, but it is, it, it was just different. Yeah, like, it's different. Like my brother, like we were very close and I went home and I was like, we had to go view his body. And I remember just being like, what? I'm going to go like, see my brother, like in his shell. Like, and I was like, right. well, I'm going to write, I'm going to write. And right then, like I started the song that day, the day before we went to the funeral home. And I worked from that day and the entire rest of that month in Florida because there were so many emotions that month. I mean, continuous, but I wrote that song over the full month. I didn't try to write it in one night, but what mm. I did was every single night after everyone went to bed, I'd go down into my parents' living room and I, my dad's a, a guitarist. So I would grab one of his guitars and I had a notebook. And every night I worked on a, one line from the song. Mm. because it changed every night like what i was feeling and i just was like he, he was so fresh in my mind i had just seen him like a month before you know he like touched my head and said he loved me it was like a just rent you know random like i saw him i was in town for a show and i was just like man I, i'm gonna forget like i'm i don't want to forget this i don't want right. to forget this closeness so every night it was like just finding like i didn't i didn't like it was finding not only the right words, but the right chords because your chords and your words, like your chords are just as important. The notes that you pick, like, and I wanted the notes to capture him as much as I wanted the lyrics to capture him and I wanted them to go together. So even, you know, I originally put out a version, I put it up like within a month, I put out a, my demo version. Um, because I just, I, I was so felt so close to it and I wanted to share it. So I had put that up online first, which, um, that's, you know, hopefully I, I would really like to put that out again on the, the demo. Um, yeah, the demo, but then, you know, when I approached Jeremy who produced Babel and had has produced like Banshee and Mockingbird. And when I brought the song to him for the version that's on this record now, I said to him, cause sometimes the producer wants to change a chord here and there or change a couple things producers yeah. have their opinion i said to yeah. him it's a jeremy you cannot change any chords these chords are deliberate right nothing can change with this and so nothing like all those chords are the same chords that and i had to be really like i, I just said like he's as much in the chords as he is in the lyrics and those chords and those lyrics and those melodies crisscross a certain way like they're the way that that built that song for me and and so that's why i'm just so proud of the way it turned out and that like i'm glad i stuck to my stuck to my like gut for that because that yeah it's i tell everyone whenever i play it live you know i play stripped down live a lot and i say to people like this is the hardest song i ever wrote and mm. i think it will it still reigns as like the the most difficult song I ever wrote, but man, I'm I'm glad I wrote it. Yeah, and um, it's funny. It you, you're you're describing it reminds me of uh, you know Bert Bacharach died a few uh, weeks ago, and um, I was reading some interviews and just just something with him, and and he was talking about his process and. It's funny. It reminds me just of what you described, not necessarily maybe one line a night, but he was talking about, and you said a very deliberate process of, you know, this, how, you know, people forget they hear these songs and especially Burt Bacharach songs, which are just part of the American, well, the global wallpaper of music, you know, where everybody's so familiar with these uh, songs, but each note, you know, e there's a reason why the, these singers and composers write each and every note where they are, you know, it doesn't just happen by accident. And that sounds very much like what you're, you described with this process. Yeah, no, I was just thinking of, I love Burt Bacharach. Like he's one of my favorites. And I was just saying to someone, like one of the reasons I like him, He's like, you know, it's him from the first like 10 right. seconds. He picks the way he, his chord changes and the way he can go into these weird minor spaces, but make a song feel like it, 
uh, it doesn't feel just because he goes minor doesn't make it feel sad. It's just this this Bert thing. Like he is right. so you just know it's Bert. And like I love that. Like whether it's Dion Warwick singing his music or it's him himself or Dusty Springfield, you're just like, man, like like Bert Bacharach, you did it again. Bert is Bert. Bert Bacharach, you did it again. I like <laughs> <laughs> good so who so tell me again who produced the original ep jeremy page jeremy page and you you write everything you could you compose everything or do you ever have a co-writer or were you did well you, he i mean for those records he lyrically i write everything lyrically and melodies and vocal arrangements that's all me like i'm i'm a i'm a nerd about vocal arrangements like that i have my my way that i do it but with like with the with like Banshee Mockingbird Babble, like Jeremy and I had had worked together for for years. Like we, I'm really into routines. So like a routine was even if we weren't specifically working on something, it would be like go to his studio in Bushwick two or three times a week and just like bring my notebook and we just write. Right. Sometimes he would start an idea, and then we'd build and we I call it ping pong because like he would start like drum and bass line and then i'd be like hold on and i run into the sound vocal booth and then start a vocal melody idea whether it's like vowels or maybe a, a full line whatever it is mm. and then lay that and then i run back out and then that kind of pings him to be like oh i hear this and we kind of would do that back and cool. forth right. and then sometimes we'd get a song in a day sometimes we'd get you know certain and then we would just kind of work at it or sometimes like there's songs like the song woman on Babel. I remember, I feel like I went, I went up to his keyboard and I just heard like a, those first like little bits of that song. I heard right. it almost more of like a three piece, like, um, like, a some sort of like gospel type of mm. feel. And I remember, I mean, it was so, it was a little while ago, but I remember being like, Hey, playing. And then he would go and riff from that and took it where he took it. And it was still, and then yeah, there's those songs like Ride On, which was one that I just was like, here, don't you just produce don't, it? Don't, don't you touch it. Yeah. Leave it alone. But I mean, also I have so many songs that I, I write, you know, I write I play guitar as well and a little bit of I play enough keys to maybe write a tune, but not not stand on a stage and play the keyboard. Um, but I do write a ton at home. I have like voice memos and eight tracks and so many other songs that like I'm excited to tackle and release, you know, release all that stuff. Right. Next. And uh, your vocal approach, your attack on this uh, album is, you know, maybe like a little laid back. It was like a little subdued. I was just trying to listen, you know, and I was thinking, you know, this is like, you know, in the pocket, you're, 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 you felt like you were, trying to achieve a certain thing you know what do you think about as you approach how you're going to present a song vocally um i don't know i feel like my voice when i approach a song like i'm a visual artist as well right so when i sing almost i have to see a picture in my head of like this the, i get kind of tipped off by if i'm like working with like jeremy or work with a co-writer and we have like a little bit of like a certain like maybe farfisa or some sort of like a uh, keyboard or a sound that starts to kind of create the soundscape. Then in my head, like I visually like my voice wants to sometimes my voice wants to go and like um, I hear like I like on like wizards float. I called it. I was telling Jeremy, I was like, I need to do these, like, I call them my old lady, my old lady voices. <laughs> okay. And I was like, I got these old ladies that want to, you know, these old lady voices that want to sing. So it was like, you know, when I go into that, like operatic, like the vibrato and the falsetto, and that gives a certain like visual in your head and adds to like the way you can paint a song. Like the thing that, about music that some people I think realize maybe some people don't maybe I'm even crazy for thinking this but music is visual right. music is so visual like that's why like when like I don't know like sometimes I I felt like songs are colors and actually someone told me that's called something 
Um, well, it's I, funny you mentioned Frank Sinatra before, but he used to do those uh, tone poems or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. where here's a song, Orange, you know, is like that synesthesia or whatever it is, you yeah. know, where, where you kind of hear something and, oh, that's that's really green, you know? Totally. And like, even like, like I, I always think like, and so I think when I'm singing, I get very visual about it, you know, like to me, the song Concrete Waves is the color blue or... um like uh i'm 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 thinking back to exactly the banshee songs because i just the, those are so strong to me like um if you didn't go is the color yellow you mm -hmm. know it's it goes into the voice in the in that song there's all this um that like that like light falsetto almost like the sesame street voices of all the <sighs> kids like when i when you hear a group of kids singing in uh in the high key um like a, a young boys choir or something it's right it, the way their tones just like it's this warm buttery sound and butter is yellow and that's where like vocally that's where i go as i see like uh, a picture in my head and then i want to go there with with the sounds with the sounds and the colors i'm glad you mentioned wizards float i think that's my favorite uh tune on this album and it is really an interesting one you know the arrangements are great the composition's great and i love the string parts i love those string arrangements and uh, as you said your vocals are you know they're intriguing and uh, you showcase a lot of different facets on there it's much different from uh the other songs on that on the album i feel like uh, anything else about uh those floating wizards you could tell us about I mean, I remember like lyrically, I'm so like intrigued by dreams. And I mean, lyrically, like I'm so intrigued by dreams. Like I actually had a nap today and I couldn't even like wait. I would have one of those dreams where you can't wake up from it. I right. was like, I was in a meeting and someone, I was talking to someone, but I couldn't open my eyes in the dream. Like sleep paralysis? Kind of. Like I was like, I can't open my eye. I was in this meeting in the dream, but I couldn't open my eyes. And then I was like apologizing. I was like, I don't know why. Oh yeah. I'm actually sleeping right now. And then finally I woke up from my nap and I was like, Oh, I opened him. But I mean, I think like, I've always been intrigued about like where we go and we sleep, like the strange places. Like, what is this? I'm intrigued in the afterlife, like all these like these things beyond like the here and now like mm. well, like there's just so it, it it's so big i don't even know i haven't died yet and nobody's come back to be like this is what happens this you is know? what happens no. or we, so like wizards float is a lot is kind of about dreaming and just like i i don't even remember how I feel like I just, I think the name Wizards Float kind of came with that too. Like in my dreams, there's definitely wizards floating around and it's just kind of like an ode to um, like unanswered questions. And like, same with like epilogue, that whole song is like, I love telling stories and that was just a straight story song about like these different characters and the ways that they all, you know, they all died. And it's just, it's crazy. Babel is really, I called that record Babel after the Babel in my head. I'm constantly, even like I'm trying to me meditate lately. Like I try mm. to just in the mornings have like, I've set my alarm between five and eight minutes of just a quiet. Like I just sit right here actually. And my dogs are usually snoring next to me. Not I'm easy just, to do with kids. I'll tell you that much. Meditation I, is not easy to do with kids. No. So like in the mornings I have like my five minutes and at the time of Babel, I wrote it, I called it Babel because I just am a mile a minute thinking, even when I try to meditate, I'm still like thinking about 10,000. I got to do this. And what right. does this mean? And so Babel is just an ode to all my thoughts. The and river questions. of thoughts running through your mind at any given time. Yeah. Just stream of consciousness. That's it. You could see I'm a little bit of a record collector over here. And, it's amazing. Uh, and I, real. I learned I was very excited reading about your story um, that the original EP that you had released, I guess there was a small vinyl run and they were, uh, you know, uh, hand, I guess that you, you kind of hand designed the covers on them. And I'm sure they're probably valuable right now. I didn't look them up, but, uh, but uh, tell us about what those original copies looked like in 2016 that you had. What were there like 50 of them or something? 100? 50 of them. It took me a year to make them. It took me a year to make these covers. 
Wow. Um, do you have I, any? Do you have one now? I don't even it? have one. My parents have one. I hope they'll like maybe give it back to me. I don't even have one. I mean, I can show you the, I think I have the one without it because I made 300 total. This okay. is what the record, but right in this, in this corner right here. That's the original. This is the original, but without the collage. Okay. So what I would do, I had 300 of these and I actually sold out of all of them now, even the 300, but of the 50, on this corner, I made this entire collaged um, apocalyptic world. Like I've been collaging for years and I also do collage animation and it's like another, like, it's just another branch off of me and it like kind of goes in, in, it's, it's in step with my music. They, they ping pong each other, Sure. but I had done all these like little weird vintage apocalyptic worlds mm. and then i hid myself in all of them they're tiny self portraits so so there was 50 different ones it took me a year my poor like husband i usually wind up like dragging him into every project um he's an artist as well so i was like can you uh he's uh he's a tattooer but i'm always like hey like can you and he, he he's way more of a uh, perfectionist than me of keeping so his he was he was like more of like well we need to schlack them we need to protect them so right we turned our whole like house you could like we filled the floor with the records when i was done with them and his job would be to get the polyurethane or the the coat to like okay. after i built out the collages and we would seal them all because you know i wanted the i want these collages to last for someone forever yeah, right the apartment was like a giant toxic meth like so many fumes but they turned out like beautiful like you can go on my website and see them all if you go into there's a link that says the 50 and you can see them all because i i listed them there i sold out within like oh. i think a day but you can see all the pic and also in the babble the new vinyl all those little collages inside that's like 30 of them and okay. then people who did the pre-order got a lyric sheet and on the opposite side of the lyric sheet is um, a letter that I wrote. And then you can see all 50 collages. Oh, It's kind of almost like a Where's Waldo because you can see every single one of the collages and we uploaded them digitally. But yeah, 50 people have that record. And like my dream was always to like have like kind of like like Willy Wonka have like a go have like, you know, so someone someone who like. I I treasure my fans and people who have like stuck with me since day one. So I yeah. always want to like make them feel as special as they make me feel. So yeah. hoping that I hope that one day those records will be worth something because that's I wanted it to be like a special gift to just, you know, stay. well, hopefully no one that purchased one will ever get rid of it. But I will be on the lookout uh, in my travels. And if I find one, I'm going to snatch it up quickly i know there's one in st petersburg florida oh that's my that's that's the parents <laughs> yeah. yeah um i love your uh i love your aesthetic you know i love your style no one can mistake seeing you when they're seeing you and you've got a real trademarked style happening and do you do you see yourself as a bit of a street style influencer you know what are what, what, what you know how could i improve my uh my own personal brand of uh style you know what 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 do you what do you how do you put your 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 look together you know i just feel like it's kind of another extension of my creativity i i, I don't really wear things because everybody else i've never been like into trends i've always been like well what feels good to me and like i've, I've actually you know i have like an, an eight-year-old and i always explain to her like you can express yourself through your fashion. Like you can be just as artistic in what you wear. Right. So I let her, I let her pick her own clothes and like her own outfits. Um, unless it doesn't make sense with the weather, but it's like, I don't know. I always just kind of like, I also have always dressed in sort of seasonal themes. Like I remember at one point I wanted to just my, my it, it's almost like I reference something and then base all my looks like when I would shop or pick clothes out like one was like old man <laughs> <laughs> one year I was like I wanted to just dress like a an old man so I wore a lot of but still like how could what's my twist on that so that was my right. like seasonal it was like a, a half a year theme I wore a lot of like sweaters and I had like these other like 
I would, I ha wore this, like, I remember I would part my hair, you know, I did like a comb over, Okay. but it was still me. Like, it's still right. like, what's the kinder version? Because you can have, you know, just as much fun. And like, I think I've really finally settled into, um, <laughs> I love Florida. I'm so inspired every time I go back there. And I'm like, man, I just want to be a grandma from Palm Beach. Right. <laughs> you know, but I, I think the thing I always just say, like, do what you what makes you feel like you're expressing your the inside of you. Like, right. how can you express what's inside of you outwardly? You get to be your own walking canvas. So. Right. Well, I, I should have worn some glasses. I wear glasses too. I should have worn some glasses for this interview today, but I didn't. Oh. Yeah, I'm so Next blind. Time. Next time. <laughs> Next are those time. Are those prescription? Yeah. They are. All right. When I when my eyesight started to go, I was like, well, if I'm going to wear glasses, I'm going to make them like a part of me. Like You're wearing glasses. Yeah, I'm definitely wearing glasses. You no are taking it. No one can argue that you're wearing glasses. You know, this show is called Radar, but if I turn the mic over to you and ask what's on your personal radar lately, what are you what are you loving? Uh, what are you reading, listening, watching? Uh, uh, what's your what's on your your radar right now? What would you say? Um, oh man, that's not to put you, I know I put you on the spot on that one. Okay, I'm gonna just I'm gonna talk about a movie that I just rewatched. Okay. This is just since we're just like, what's on? I Rewatched. I hadn't watched it in a while. I love B horror movies. Okay. I rewatched Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh yeah, with the the uh, the uh, the Dickies did the soundtrack. Yeah, the Dickies. Dickies did the soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. I have it over. I actually have the soundtrack. Yeah, I've done it on my little karaoke show before. I've done that song. Yeah, Killer Clown from Outer Space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Um. The. The uh, I forgot these two like animation got brothers these brothers who are really into special effects and stop motion did the movie in the eighties. It's such an amazing movie, and I'm t I always tell people, have you seen Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Everything a man I already know my, the inspiration for my next record. We're gonna go to the circus. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> it's just... so like I watched it the other night, and I was like, oh my gosh! Like first of all, like the colors. The colors are amazing. The sets are amazing. But besides that, like the genuine, like that movie is so solid in what a great idea. Mm. Killer clowns that come down from outer space and turn people into cotton candy. Right. And then drink the people. And then they're also killing the whole town by shooting them with popcorn that grows in the middle. They're, they or like they both like all the different ways that they get it it's just like that's on my radar because i'm like i get so inspired when just to be that creative that you go i love when someone is i'm sure they sat around they're like let's make a movie about like clowns and they're gonna like come down in a giant tent and like right. Someone was probably like, you can't, that's the dumbest. You can't do that. What? And they were like, yeah, it, you know, it's one of those movies where they're like, yeah, watch me. Right. And it's like, they really pulled it off and they did it amazing. And I, I'm just like, I talk, I'm putting that on my radar because it's a great example of like being a yes person and not a no person. And when people say no, like when people tell me, no, you can't do that. I say, watch me. Watch it. Yeah. You know? All right. So next time you go to your local VHS cassette rental store, yeah, because there's so many. Up, pick up Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Yeah. The only thing I remember about that movie is I lighting. I can I can see. You know what's weird about that movie? Clowns in the dark, like mm -hmm. clowns. I can see the you know the face of a clown, <laughs> but the lighting is so dark, and it's kind of a weird. Yeah. You know I mean? You're not used to seeing a clown in dark lighting. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. And if you are seeing clowns in dark lighting, uh, what's going on? You're uh, you're in sleep paralysis. And you need to wake up. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting ready to embark on a big tour in the next few days with lots of European dates. And uh, are you looking forward to this? Uh, I mean, are you do you like uh, life on the road? Are you uh, you looking forward to this adventure? I am so excited. Europe touring in europe they treat you like you're treated like royalty there right like they treat you so well there's places to stay when you do a tour here 
it's so stressful, especially if you're kind of tour managing your own band or you've got to find the places to stay. It's like, it's just a whole, but in Europe, they like, most of the venues have apartments attached, at least in, in, in France, that's a big thing. Like there's usually like, or people like are like, do you, we have an extra, do you need a place to stay? Like, it's just so, so much less sh- stress. And I just love the, like, there's just a, they're just very grateful for you coming over and bringing a show. Accommodating, appreciative. Yeah. And so I'm really, I'm excited. I'm actually usually like, usually I'm like so stressed about like preparing for a tour, especially when it's a week out. Usually I've already have piles of clothes everywhere. Mm. I mean, it's kind of messy in here now, but not because of my, I just because I'm messy lately. But usually it's like mayhem because I'm like, I have so much stuff to do and I haven't really stressed out that much about it. I had a great, you know, I've been doing the things to keep the stress at bay. Like I had a really good call with Sebastian from Winston Brothers because they're going to be my backing band over there. So they're going to open the set and then, um, and then there'll be my band, but I had a great call with him the other day. I sent him my set list here. We went through all like, and just knowing like that everybody wants this to be a good show. So everybody's like doing the things to make it run smooth. Like I, you know, I have a, a manager that's great and like, it helps me to stay. I'm easy to be like this when I have a lot going on. It keeps me like, all right, today like we're gonna knock this this and this out and that's been really helpful and I'm, I'm not so so stressed actually but probably ask me again in three days and it's right. gonna be a different conversation <laughs> as it gets closer yeah 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 well where where should people go uh, to find out more about this reissue and just to find out about you and to find out about these uh uh tour dates or upcoming releases what where, where, where should people go to find out more I mean a lot of- I, I, my website, Kendra Morris music, there's links for everything there. Also coal mine. If you go to the coal mine record site, you can directly order the vinyl there, go to your local record shop, like support small businesses, support your local record shop. That is a system. If you go to a record shop, you buy a record there. You are helping a small business owner. You're helping a musician directly. You're helping the indie record label. And it just, I can't say enough. Go to, I tell people all of their, like, should I get your record on Amazon? Can I go and get it? I'm like, you know what? Look up the record store in your town. And that's a great way to find new music. You go to your record store, they're going to be playing a record that maybe you're going to be into that too. You wind up walking out with three records. Like that's how you discover new stuff. So I always say go to your record store. It's, it's carried in most, you know, record stores. You can find me. I use Instagram um, a lot. And you might get lucky finding one of those first 50 releases of the original EP of Babel. But if you can't find that (laughs) run out to your record store and buy the, the brand new reissued version on coal mine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. It was really, really wonderful talking to you.